Is that working? Okay. Hello. Good morning. Sunday morning. Yay. Um, thanks for coming. Were some of you here yesterday? Yeah. Do you feel really inspired? Can you all tweet? Like crazy tweeting, just keep tweeting, 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 because then it helps the festival. That's not an advertisement. Um, I'm Monica Ducks, and I'm part of the Feminist Writers Festival board, and I'm here to introduce this panel today. Uh, welcome. I've got notes. Someone, see, th this festival is so beautifully uh, peopled by lots of volunteers that they even wrote notes for me to read out to you, which I should because it's better than my ramble. Welcome to the 2018 Feminist Writers Festival. Our festival is being held on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Thanks for coming along this afternoon to this session. This morning. Is it the afternoon? Is it the afternoon? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> mentoring feminists, mentoring writers. Our mentoring is a critical part of the creative life, but something women and non-binary writers are often excluded from. Without mentoring, writers and artists can miss out on important networks or opportunities, and sometimes it can be hard to even get a foot in the door. And as we all know, people's lives can be so uh, profoundly changed by finding someone who really wants to champion and support their work. Uh, before we get started, please turn off your phones to silent. <clears throat> yeah, you don't. Turn, you just turn them to silent, don't you? Because you're tweeting the whole time. <laughs> Loving this session. Wow. Um, yeah, I'll see. But we'd also love to hear from you. So please join in the conversation on Twitter or Facebook using the hashtag. So yeah, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So the panelists, Jennifer Mills. Uh, oh, Jen, as I was calling her in the green room. She's the author of the novels Gone and The Diamond Anchor and the short story collection The Rest Is Wait. In 2012, she was named a Sydney Morning Herald Best Young Australian Novelist. Jennifer is a fiction editor at Overland Literary Journal and her most recent book is Dyschronia. Natalie Conyu is a creative writer, editor and academic. She also has a three-month-old at home, so she may... Um, start weeping. Yeah, or napping. <laughs> she's yeah. quite amazing, Natalie. Um, she's currently working on her first novel and a project examining the representation of women in Australian publishing. Natalie won the Catherine Susanna Pritchard Emerging Writer in Residency, an Australian Society of Authors mentorship, and has been long listed for the Australian Vogel Award. And Jacinda Woodhead is the editor of Overland, a literary magazine of progressive politics and culture founded in 1954. Her PhD research examined abortion politics and narrative nonfiction as political intervention. Let me throw to our chair for this session. <laughs> Sorry. This is a really good script, whoever wrote it. Thank you. <laughs> Jacinda Woodhead. I'll be back in about an hour to facilitate a broader discussion. So we are going to, yeah, so they're going to talk for about an hour and then we're going to have questions. This, is, well, this whole session is going to take place over about two hours. So when we get to questions, I'm going to be holding the mic. If you want to come up to the chair here, or raise your hand and, and um, ask a question. And yeah, oh, and also let me just um, impress upon you the importance of respectful uh, language, etc. So yeah, here we go. Thank you, Monica. Uh, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, I've been thinking about the idea of mentoring a lot lately um, because of my own experiences of taking over land, um, taking over Overland at the start of 2015. Uh, in retrospect, I wish I had had a mentor that a woman who'd had a similar position at some stage as me had checked in periodically to see how uh, it was going at the magazine. Um, if I wanted to talk to or needed to debrief or to say that, it, uh, even just to tell me that the industry will work against you in many ways um, as a woman in a quite a senior position. Um, that your labor won't be seen, that your role will be viewed more as administrative than an artistic or editorial, unlike your male counterparts. Uh, that people will question how you got the role, why you deserve it, why you're paid, and so on. 
Uh, I have to say the only people who actively reached out were the women academics in creative writing at Victoria University, one of whom was Natalie, and they took me out to lunch. They would come by the office regularly and ask, you know, basically those things, and <laughs> we'd share all kinds of uh, information, and that support was really um, important to me. I think that sexism by its very nature means that white men are acting as mentors for each other already, uh, which I think explains much of the nepotism that you see happening in the arts and literature more generally. Um, but it's not just white men. I think um, you know, it's everybody's role that when asked for writers, uh, commissions, ideas, people to participate in panels, many people will put forward uh, those recognizable names. And those recognizable names are often uh, men, mostly white, who are usually already have plenty of opportunities in literature. Uh, I also think that without mentoring, people are reliant on their current networks. So if you're already excluded, this is exacerbated. And I think I'm really championing at the moment this idea of active mentoring, um, which is kind of the same as active editing or reading. So if you don't actively do something to counter the biases that we have, um, they just keep happening. Uh, so in summary, I think we need more opportunities for formal and informal mentoring because I want to see the landscape of the arts and literature and its discriminatory practices continue to change. So that's my introduction, really, to the panel and what I was thinking about. But, um, but I'm so excited to have Jen and Nat here today because they're both phenomenal writers and editors, but also fantastic people who are really generous with their time and, and reaching out to other people. So I'm really curious to hear what their thoughts are on some of these ideas. Jen, I know you had an experience in mentoring that you wanted to talk about. I don't know if you wanted to start with that. Yeah, sure. Um, so when I was writing my first novel, The Diamond Anchor, which um, is a queer love story set in Wollongong, I um, sounds great, doesn't it? I was selling it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was living in Alice Springs, and I didn't really know um, anything much about the literary industry. Um, I'd not not sort of been involved in any sort of institutional writing stuff in Sydney apart from university level stuff. And then I'd been traveling and hoboing around the world and ended up moving to Alice Springs and it was in Alice that I really found a, um, a good creative kind of context for, that supported the work that I was doing and where I was able to sort of um, take myself seriously as a writer, I suppose. Um, but the part of that was the Northern Territory Writers' Centre, who were just really fantastic and um, programmed me in events and um, helped me find other writers around um, the place. And so I applied to them, their mentorship program that they were running. Um, and I had a manuscript at that point that I was ready to work. But I just, um, you know, when you're starting out with a book, you don't know if you're on the right track, it turns out with the fourth book, you still don't know if you're on the right track about 90% of the time. But I didn't know that then, and I didn't have um, the experience to trust my own instincts. So I was really looking for someone who um, would be able to just guide me, give me a bit of advice, maybe you know, read the work, and um, just let me know whether I was on the right path or not. So I applied for this mentorship program, and I was successful. Um, and my mentor was an older fellow who lived in another state. And uh, I met with him once when he had, was visiting Alice Springs. Um, and it was, seemed like a, he seemed like a nice fellow, like he was a pretty decent bloke. But I sent him my work and then I didn't hear from him for a few weeks. So then I would email him again, and he would send me little messages like, oh yeah, I'm getting to it. And you know, he had an academic job, and he was also uh, mentoring the writing program in the Alice Springs Dale at the time. And so me being a, a young, innocent writer, without you know, wanting to be too demanding or put pressure on this poor fellow who was very busy, you know, I stepped back and I thought, well, he's, he's obviously, you know, giving priority to these writers in prison who probably really need the support. You know, I, I probably know what I'm doing. I can probably work it out on my own. So I kind of let this whole situation slide quite a while. And then I was at an event and I was um, chatting to the woman who was running the 
literary program, the writing program in the Alice Springs jail. And I said, oh, how's the mentoring going with the fellas? Because I've been having a bit of trouble getting um, communication happening with this guy. And she said, actually, he's been ignoring all of our messages. And the guys in jail have just been writing increasingly vile and horrible stories in the hope of getting his attention. <laughs> and she was really struggling because she was coming up with all of these murders and they were just getting worse and worse. And I said, geez, Lenny, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> so um, I guess the reason that I wanted to tell that story is because um, the people that I found in Alice Springs that ended up working as my mentors and my peers weren't the people that I found through this formal channel. They were the people who were in the Northern Territory Writers' Centre organising this kind of thing. They were, they were my colleague at Bachelor who was the teacher of that prison program. Um, they were the friends that I met in that context and my peers who were able to help me um, take myself seriously as a writer. And I think um, you know, sometimes we look to these very formal structures for mentoring when actually the, the people that we need or the relationship that we need is a little bit more distributed in the people around us. Mm. I think that's a, a great point and you said a, a phrase a couple of times, you know, taking yourself seriously as a writer and I think for those of us who are, who are women writers or non-binary writers that taking yourself seriously as a writer is made very difficult by the industry that we're in mm. because it is so masculine, it is so wide, it is so heteronormative, it is so middle class. Honestly, <laughs> the Australian writing industry is a joke. Am I allowed to say that? Um, <laughs> it's, you know, you have to be incredibly privileged, I think, um, to start. And if you're, if you're very privileged, I think you're kind of starting at a, a, a different place from the rest of us. Um, and I was really touched when I met Jacinda during the week and she said to me that um, she thought of me as a mentor and I, I'm going to blush because I, I had never thought of myself in that way. And I think one of the things we get caught up with in mentorship is what you described, you know, the, the elder statesperson who is supposed to guide us through, you know, the, the trials and tribulations of the industry and, and look out for our work. I sometimes think that kind of mentorship, like you, doesn't work. It's, mm. um, it's so artificial. And when I think of my own experiences in looking for mentors for myself, and the, you know, the advice I would give everyone in the room is to, to find people who, whose work you really admire, who you have things in common with. So for me, you know, I have someone I would consider a mentor, and I have a lot of people who I would consider to be critical friends. So people who will read my work, people who will comment, people who will encourage me. And I don't think that's any less valuable than, you know, an elder person who knows the industry. Mm. Which is not to say that we shouldn't think about that as well. I don't know, I think a lot of, I think to be a feminist writer is to have a responsibility, and, and you and I were talking about this towards mentoring or being a mentor or a mentee. Um, yeah, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on, on that as well. Yeah, so I think um, everything that you've said so far is, is definitely true. Um, I, earlier I was reading this discussion on LitHub, which I'm sure many of you may be familiar with the site, between a number of women editors. Um, and I think this came out after um, the incident at the Paris Review, where it turned out I don't remember whether the editor, um, I can't remember if he resigned or was fired mm -hmm. after it turned out that he'd been sexually harassing oh, women yeah. writers and stuff Step for, a long, for a long time. <laughs> and so I think this um, discussion started among all these women editors and writers about what had helped them in the industry. And one of them said, um, describe what she thinks mentoring is. And she said, although we don't usually think of it in this way, mentorship involves taking risks. It means sticking your neck out for an unproven talent introducing junior colleagues or students to people who are powerful in your own world, promoting someone to grow into a job, publishing a piece that has a few lingering problems because the author's voice is important. And like, I, think, I think that that's true. But I agree with what you say, Jen, about this idea. I'm really keen to see more communities 
of writers and people interested in the arts more generally and in creating works um, and how we support each other to do that. And, um, and rather than this kind of hierarchical position or this idea that, you know, like networking, okay, so <laughs> I know people are very, uh, think, you know, networking is really important and obviously it is, but I hate going to events, mm. like personally, and I find that stuff very stressful and um, I think that most people feel like that because that's probably why they're attracted to writing in the first place, <laughs> which is often a very solitary activity. Um, but also, I think this is something we talked about the other day, Natalie. I'm not sure it always helps to be introduced to the right people. I don't yeah. know what I mean. I don't even know what really the right people are, given, um, I don't know, maybe it's different if you're writing a book. I don't know. But like at Overland, um, we try to keep, we, we, we publish a lot of new writers, and um, particularly for our online magazine, I think that probably 60 to 70 percent of the people we publish are new writers, and sometimes their very first piece they've ever had published is published on Overland. And so it can be their first experience of an editorial experience and that kind of relationship of someone believing in your work but also wanting to kind of be the best that it can be, um, or that maybe it just needs a bit more you know, polishing and there's something you haven't quite said yet that you're really keen to say. Um, and I think that all of that is really valuable as well. I think I've lost my change of thought. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I think it, it, it's part of the um, part of the role of Overland. I think is to be this sort of community hub, and um, perhaps uh, what you're saying about not needing to meet the right people sort of makes sense to me as well. Because you know, I live in regional South Australia, I'm not going to be going to events at the Wheeler Centre and bumping into people. Um, you know, I'm at a stage in my career where I don't need that kind of schmoozing anyway, but um, probably 10 years ago it would have been quite useful. Mm. But I think it's more important to have um, probably genuine relationships with people. I don't want to sound mean, but I think there's a lot of um, social climbing in the arts especially when you are trying to push a book or trying to get a publishing deal, there's a tendency to think of literature as this vertical structure that you're working your way up from the bottom rungs and that these are stepping stones on the way, like getting published in a literary journal is a stepping stone on the way. And I think at Overland, part of our role is to break that model a little bit and make it a little bit more horizontal and look at actually how's what does the work say and why is this of social value and why are these voices being amplified? Um, yeah, I think... I'm sorry, I think I remember what I was going to say now as well. <laughs> In addition to that is that I think the magazine publishing or the kind of roles that the literary magazines serve is quite different, I think, to book publishing, mm. you know, which I think often does really, you know, it's a commercial, it's a commercial venture and so I think it relies on different kinds of relationships, which isn't to put any of you off writing a book. If any of you are writing a book, I would you know, fully endorse that. Um, but I guess I wanted to... I write books. <laughs> Ruins your life. Um, I wanted to talk a bit more about this idea of like this active mentoring or informal mentoring and formal mentoring. At Overland, we did recently start um, a mentoring program, which is part of our writers in residence program. So we got funding a couple of years ago to run two different writers in residence program for um, writers we felt were underrepresented um, in border publishing. And so one was for a woman writer who is um, the sole caregiver of children and, um, and the other one was for a First Nations writer. And so both of those are finished now, but what it did was provide a stipend for the writer, uh, an office space for three months that has you know, a desk and computer facilities and free printing and that sort of thing. And is it based at VU? all of these wonderful supportive academics <laughs> and writers and um, and so to give them to give these writers a community like space there and access to other people working you know in literature and publishing and writing but also this mentoring aspect which was um, with the first residency it was with Alison Krogan um, who's an incredible writer and the second one was with um, Alan Van Nierven and that that residence is just finishing up now I think that the, I made some notes about this because I think it's really important that when we talk about mentoring, um, we, 
the reason that we wanted to combine um, this writers in residence program or, or design it in this way was because we wanted to, to give people the opportunity to prioritize their practice. Um, and so that's why we decided to combine the mentorships with the paid writing residencies. Um, but with mentoring, not every shape of mentoring fits each writer. So it's not, not just in terms of schedules and when you can meet or that kind of thing, but also what people want from that relationship. So maybe it's feedback on a chapter. Maybe it's about, um, maybe it's about what you do when you sent your book off, not to another mentor, but to like a publisher, an editor, and they don't get back to you for six months, eight months, 10 months. Like how do you handle that kind of stuff? And how do you keep going? And I, I just think that it's just so individual between the mentor and the mentoree about how that relationship works. Um, and what you want out of it. Actually, I should also mention, if I can just briefly plug, that we have an event coming up at the Emerging Writers Festival, which is the current resident, Lani Abgasson and Alan Van Niven talking about mentoring and what they've done in that relationship. And I think that will be really valuable because Alan Van Niven's done a lot of mentoring, which is incredible. Mm. Um, and am I talking too much? Do you know what I So just back to this idea of, um, of some of the ideas I had about the kind of informal and formal mentoring. And I guess from working in a magazine and, and how you see that that works on a kind of daily basis. Um, so... I was going to... Can I interrupt yeah, you? Because I think you take a very different approach to right. other editors of literary journals because any ed editor of a literary journal in Australia, be it Griffith or Sydney Review of Books, Overland or Mianjin, you are a gatekeeper to the industry, you know, you are letting people through the gates. They are, you, as you say, you're getting, you, you, people are getting their first major publications through Overland. And I think a lot of gatekeepers don't care um, or, or let the same people through the gates always. So I actually think what you do at Overland is very valuable if you are looking for different voices, different writers, people who are not so experienced because you are actually, I don't know, I see that as a form of mentorship because you are helping someone through a gate that wouldn't necessarily get through a gate and you're being very aware of your position. I mean, I've been edited by Jacinda. It's an amazing experience. She is such a great editor. Like, she is fantastic and so engaged in the work, you know, just so engaged, like, she really cares. And I think too often in this industry, the gatekeepers are really kind of blasé. Mm. I, I did an interview with 3CR last week in preparation for this, and the interviewer said to me, um, a lot of the male writers I know don't need mentors or don't think they need mentors. And I said, they are being mentored all the time. Blokes in this industry are being mentored all the time. They write, I think the number of, um, literary fiction that men in Australia publish compared to women is something like 35% compared to 65%. Yet they are overrepresented on panels, they are overrepresented in review pages, they are overrepresented in um, awards, they mm. are probably overrepresented in editorial boards, everywhere that, you know, this 35% makes so much, takes up so much room and so much oxygen yeah. um, in our industry. And, and I think it's like other industries, this stuff becomes more noticeable the further along in your career mm. you are. I think when I was an emerging writer, I felt that the playing field was a little more equal than I do now. Um, now that I'm seeing my male peers uh, moving into um, arenas that perhaps they have uh, more access to just mm. because of this sort of invisible um, promotion that happens. Yeah, it's like a guy puts his arm around another guy at a party and says, look, I want you mm. to make this editor or I think you should send this work to this publisher. I mean, it's very hard to imagine anyone saying about any female Australian novelist and, you know, God forbid if she's not white, heterosexual, blah, 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 you know, this is going to be the great Australian novel. When we think of the great Australian novel or we think of the great Australian novelist or the great American novelist, you know, again, Jonathan Franz, and, um, you know, we, we tend to think of blokes. And so there's this bias that keeps the industry um, locked to a lot of us. Yeah. And you're right, the further up 
you go, it's like academia. The further up you go, the more sausages are swinging around the room. <laughs> so it feels like that sometimes. <laughs> and so I think, I, I honestly think that part of the responsibility of a feminist and of a feminist writer is to be a mentor or to be um, aware of your own privilege within the industry and to do what you can to raise up mm. other voices because if you're a feminist in this industry, you know that the industry is stacked against you and, and, and that's how it is. So if you, you know, take your responsibility as a feminist writer seriously, I think it is about, you know, um, helping new and up and coming writers in the industry. Um, so in terms of mentorship myself, as I said, I have mentors and people I would consider critical friends and writing groups. But um, a couple of years at v ago at VU, a friend and I, the woman I would consider to be my mentor, Enza Gandolfo, who's just uh, released a book called The Bridge, a novel about the Westgate Bridge. And um, I've started reading it. It's fucking fantastic. So I urge you all to find it. Um, she and I sat and said, you know what, we need a feminist research network at this university. We need someone to highlight the work that feminist researchers are doing because there are so many of us in disparate fields and we're all getting forgotten because, you know, in engineering, these guys are being highlighted or in literature, these guys are being highlighted. So we need someone, we need an organisation to do that. So we. We, s we set about, you know, launching this, getting um, women who wanted to be on the committee that, you know, the board or the committee. We decided to call ourselves a board because we thought if we were a group of men, we'd be calling ourselves a board. So let's be a board, <laughs> um, not a committee. Uh, so we got a whole bunch of women on the board. And one of the first things we thought to institutionalise was a mentorship program because academia is one of those industries, just like writing, where the further up you go, um, the more you are aware of the bias that is against you as a woman mm. um, academic. And so, you know, we set this mentorship up and it was enormously useful. It had a huge uptake. People all around the university, um, you know, went for this program and got mentors and mentees. and. I mean, I, I got a mentor who was a professor. She was she researches in um, medical ethics, so different field, but we are so similar. So whoever paired us up was just amazing. But to know for me to have a woman that I can go to and say, "Hey, I'm having trouble with this. How would you do it?" And whenever I go and see Deb, she's just like in her office, opens the door. Yep, let's sit down and chat. I don't care. Half an hour, an hour. You know, this is what I do, you know. Yeah. If I was going for a promotion, yeah, send me your CV, I'll have a look at your CV, I'll tell you what you need to highlight. And that was the other thing we did as well. You know, we got um, the mentors to run promotion panels. So if you're going for academic promotion, it's like a friggin' 50 page, I'm not joking, a 50 page application. Um, a lot of, you know, bureaucratic terminology. You need someone to help you. Mm. you know. Um, translate. And so we would run sessions for um, women who were thinking of going for promotion so that they would have um, a more experienced female academic helping them out. So I really, you know, I really think mentorship and feminism, you know, go hand in hand. I think if you're, you know, being responsible within your industry, you have to be aware of the biases around mm. you and, and how you can help people through them. And I think that also you need to avoid repeating the same problems of like supporting like that patriarchy creates. You know, if you're a cisgender heterosexual woman, you need to make sure that you're not only supporting other cisgender heterosexual women. If you're a white woman, you need to make sure that you're supporting women of colour. Because I think being a woman, you need to be able to see that there's, um, there's other structures that intersect with the gender problem. Mm. Absolutely. I remember um, reading an article, I think it was on Feminazi, and really it was a, a woman um, talking about, she was of Asian Australian descent, and I'm of Eurasian descent, so I completely understood when she was talking about people saying, where are you from? And you say, well, I'm from Perth. No, but what, you know, where are you from? You want the name of the hospital? I mean, you know, 
Uh, so they're getting at, you know, where do you come from? You look so exotic, you look so different, blah, blah, blah. And I thought it was just a really great piece and it was really, um, yeah, it meant a lot to me. It was really pertinent. It was discussions I've had before and I just shared it in, you know, the a uh, couple of secret binder groups that I'm in. And she contacted me and said, that was so amazing. Thank you for sharing this. Like, that was incredible. And it was like, oh, my gosh, I actually, this is something that I can do for writers who are emerging, who've just started out. Because she mm. was a young writer and she was emerging and she had just started out. But, and it meant a lot for someone who she had heard of in the industry to say, hey, you should all read this. This is fantastic. So yeah. I think there are things that we can do that... I think that's take much time. No, I think yeah. there's things you can start to do like immediately today. And like one of the things I think is when somebody asks you, you know, do you know, like people ask me, they do ask me all the time, do you know a writer who could, you know, do you know a writer? We want this kind of piece, or uh, can you recommend somebody, you know, for the best the summer Australian short stories? Or, and I think that like your responsibility is to think out, like, like if you have an immediate reaction, like just stop and pause and like think about the reaction and think about who else maybe you're not seeing, you know. Um, in that equation, and I will never ever put forward just um, you know the names that I think have already had ample opportunities um, in the industry. But I think that there are lots of things that we can start doing. And actually, actually, I had a, after I had a conversation with Natalie earlier in the week, I did what you just said, Natalie, because Natalie kept talking about how important it is to raise people up. And I think that um, not only is writing isolating because it's often a solitary activity and it's often done at your computer or sometimes people do it in a cafe, but mostly people work at home in the spaces they can find, you know, to work. Um, and the other day Natalie kept talking about raising people up. And so I thought about this really good piece that we just published on Overland and it made me see this law and order SBU differently that I'd never thought about before. SUB, SBU. Anyway, um, I shared it on the Binders School of Australian Women Writers and I said this was a really great piece, you know, and this person really uh, excited me and made me think about these books that I need to read and, and just what those kind of, I don't know, what those cultural things do for people and audiences. And, um, and so all these other people went and read the work as a result. But then the person wrote to me and it really meant a lot to her. She hasn't had that much published and she really appreciated it. And um, I think it's easy to forget how important those things are because I think writing can often feel like you're like shouting into a void and it can be hard like even really established writers don't necessarily have big audiences you know in Australia you can publish a book and get maybe sell a thousand copies and that's something that's taken you years you know to work on and so I think audiences do matter and I think that kind of support does matter. <laughs> 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 that was no, no way talking Old about dream. you but yeah. um <laughs> Yeah, so I think, yeah, starting, I think starting with those kind of, just making those active decisions about what you can personally do. And if you want to mentor, I think I'd like to talk about what we think the kind of steps are that mm -hmm. you can go and find somebody. Because sometimes it can be really difficult to reach out. Like when I said earlier about starting at Overland, I probably could have tried to contact somebody else who I thought could, but I didn't really know how to start or how to yeah. do that. And, um, and, and also sometimes you just feel really paranoid about these kind of sexist things you notice or the difficulties you're having and you think, well, other people probably don't have those difficulties. Um, they're just better at it or more suited mm. to it than you are. Um, and yeah, so do you have any ideas for how, like, how people might either start supporting people more? I like just want to reinforce your point about being able to ask for help first because mm. I think that that's really important. Um, you know, I'm open to mentoring people, but if nobody um, approaches me and says, hey, I need a mentor, then that relationship's not just going to, I'm not just going to find these people on my own, you know, unless I go through a writer's centre or some other structure. So I think um, in my six, almost six years as Overland Fiction Editor, just anecdotally, young men are much better at asking for help than young women. I think, um, girls are raised to be nice rather than successful, to value um, social acceptance over personal ambition, and I don't think that's fair. I think that's something you really need to overcome as a writer. Um, and you need to do it quite consciously. You need to sit down and look at your emails and take all of the apologies and qualifiers out. I still have to do that. Yeah because you know, you're working against this training, this gender training. Um, 
Yeah, I think I'll stop there. No, I think, uh, I think a lot of people who are probably here are at the stage where they would like to, to ask for help in, am I, am I right? I'm just, yeah. And it can be really hard to ask for help. And one of, you know, the, I talked about, you know, Enza being a mentor to me and, and that relationship evolved quite naturally. We were very lucky that we worked together, but I read her work, I read her academic work, I read her creative work. Um, mm. You know, we sat across from each other at meetings, we have very similar research interests, we collaborate, we now at a point where we collaborate together on projects. And I think one of the, the tricks for me one of the, the biggest tips I could say is find someone whose work you really admire and who really resonates with you because the chances are then for the mentor is they're really interested in your work because it's similar to theirs or you're tackling the same issues or you're asking the same questions. So there are, um, the relationship becomes less hierarchical as, as you go. So it's, you, you establish much more of a, um, an equal footing as you go along. So I think that's really important. Don't just um, find someone in the industry who who looks impressive on paper. You know, don't just like call Geraldine Brooks out of <laughs> out of the blue and say, "Hey." Although you know, it must have worked for Hannah Kent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, find someone who you you've actually got. You know, you're asking the same questions. You're bothered by the same things. You have the same preoccupations whose work you admire, not only professionally, but personally, I think that's really important because then they're going to be more interested in your work as well, I think. Because I think being asked to be a mentor can be intimidating for people. Yeah, I think absolutely. Mm. Um, and when Jacinda told me I was one of her mentors, I was like, whoa, <laughs> you keep mentioning that. I am so way unqualified <laughs> to be anyone's mentor, let alone, you know, the editor of Overland, you know, being one of your informal mentors. But it's, I think you need to take that out of it and see that people just appreciate help and advice and guidance and someone they can bounce ideas off, you know, mm, someone who's similar minded. I didn't feel like much of an expert in this um, subject coming in, so I asked around um, some of the arts industry and writers, women that I know who have done a lot more mentoring on both sides than I have. and. Um, Every single one of them said it's an egalitarian relationship. It should be a relationship of equals. Mm. Um, even if it is a teacher-student thing, there needs to be mutual respect. Yes. Um, so that kind of thing is quite hard to manufacture, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, I had an experience recently where last week, um, it was the last week of um, our, in, our current intern being in the office, Rashida. Uh, and she is amazing. And unfortunately, she's not here today, I don't think. But, um, but I was working at my computer and, um, and she was having a conversation with another editorial person at Overland and I and heard her say, why do men always think they're right about everything? <laughs> and I, which I thought was really funny. I said, that's a really good question, Rashida. I hope she doesn't mind me quoting her. But then she said that she'd been reading this, um, this study that said, she was talking about job applications and, uh, um, and people here may be familiar with this study. But that if men look at a, a key selection criteria, for instance, and they've got three out of the 10, they'll say, oh, well, I'm qualified for that job, I'll take it. Whereas <laughs> women <laughs> will look at, and they only have eight or nine, and so they're like, oh, well, that's not for me. Um, and, you know, and I think, like, like everyone else has said here today, and probably over the entire festival, um, that we are trained to think like that. And, and not feel like you're enough. And there are obvious reasons, obvious systemic reasons for that. Um, but, and it's taken a while, but recently, um, I think I felt braver, like corresponding. Sometimes I have to correspond with ridiculously famous or well-known people um, you know, who write incredible emails. For instance, recently I've been uh, corresponding with the American poet and critic, Juliana Spar, who's like phenomenal and I love her work and like, we are so lucky to have this essay coming from her in the next edition. Um, and I spent ages crafting the email and like trying to say whatever I wanted and she always just replies in these one sentence emails that um, the whole sentence runs on and there's no punctuation or anything. I think well she can do that because she's a poet. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think that part of this recently I've just realized actually I'm just gonna be myself in my emails. Like that's actually the best thing to do. And so even if they are 
these ridiculously well-known people um, who you're basically begging to, like, you know, sometimes <laughs> begging them to write something for your edition for the same amount of money that everybody else gets, which is, you know, is not a lot. Um, yeah, I'm just going to do it how I would with everyone else. I was at um, Verena about 10 years ago, just when my first novel came out, and um, I was there during the Sydney Writers' Festival Blue Mountains program, and um, Eva Horning was there at the same time for the festival program, and you know, I was pretty green, so I really looked up to her. I still really look up to her. I think she's incredible. Um, she doesn't remember this, um, but she said to me, people expect you to be grateful. You don't have to be grateful. And like, I went and wrote that down and that really mattered to me, but that was just an off the cuff remark for her. Um, but I think that's one thing that I've really remembered that I try and pass on to other, to other writers is that you have a right to be there and you don't, mm. you don't need to say thanks for, thanks for giving me this opportunity all the time. Like it's really good to thank people, but it's your work that gets you there, you know, you're there for a reason because the story that you've written and sent in is of excellent quality and I'm choosing to publish it, you know. Um, sometimes I have this tricky thing, I don't know if you have this jacket Overland, but um, I want editing sometimes with uh, younger emerging writers, the um, tone of their emails will be very um, anxious and I almost want to edit the email <laughs> back to them as well and be like, no, take out these apologies, take out the seven instances of thanks and just leave one in. Like, and I, sometimes I want to just grab people and say, look, you don't have to be grateful to be here. You have a right to be here. But it doesn't feel like the forum to actually do that. Um, so I'm not sure if you have the same kind of experience. Yeah, yeah, no, um, absolutely. And recently um, I had an experience with um, a younger white male writer um, who was a fairly new writer, but I'd taken his piece ages ago and then I just kept putting it on the back burner because there was all this other stuff to do and so I kept thinking, oh, I'll get to it in the future and then uh, some time passed and he kept emailing me and he's so polite, he's like, I'm so sorry to bother you, but would you mind, um, are you still going to publish my piece? And then eventually he called me and then I realised like I'd really left it too long and that I had to get onto it. And he was so polite on the phone, he's like, I'm really sorry to bother you, but I was just wondering about my piece. And, um, and so yeah, I think, I think politeness is a really good thing. I must say, I also get some pretty bad emails sometimes when people are being rude. <laughs> but also, I just think that, you know, appreciating that other people are human beings with feelings. And, um, and the egalitarian, I, I completely agree. Just because, um, you know, you happen to work in a magazine or happen to have three books published, obviously that doesn't make you any different to anybody who wants to have a book published, you know, or wants to work at a magazine. Um, yeah. I mean, that's all I would say. Yeah, I guess getting to know your own worth is really important, even if you are looking for mentoring, looking for support from someone else. You need to know that you're the one who's still going to be doing the work mm. to get the text that you're writing into shape. You're, like, you're the one. They're not going to be sitting there saying, this is how you write, write this way. Exactly. And that's not what you want either. You just want somebody to give you, <laughs> I don't know, I think courage, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I look. The, I have not had much luck with formal mentoring or formal networks. I don't have an academic job. I don't really thrive in an institutional setting, as I was saying to Nat before. But um, like Overland's my closest thing to sort of an institution. Um, and I think the things that have really worked for me in my career are networks of solidarity and networks of community much more like and I think the places that I've found those are not really in writing communities although they have slowly developed but in um, like queer kinship kind of networks like my queer family is where I find a lot of my courage solidarity people that relate to the challenges that I face maybe and also in um, like regional arts communities can be really amazing and really strong and um, people across platforms will really support each other's work in a way like probably more of my friends close friends are visual artists than writers and I think that the challenges are really different but like in terms of sustaining a creative career and dealing with the just the emotional labor of writing and 
um, looking after yourself and all the other shit that you need to be able to manage. Like, look at it as a way of um, kind of building longevity and sustainability rather than like achievement success kind of models. I'm pretty um, horizontal, I guess, in my yeah. thinking. I think something else too that you just said that made me think of something, Jen, is that. <clears throat> Um, 95 to 98% of the time, um, no one else is going to care if you write or if you finish the work that you're writing on. Like, I mean, this is legitimate. Maybe if you've got a contract, they will. But otherwise, um, no one's like sitting around thinking, oh, when's Jacinda's book going to come out or when's Jacinda's next article going to come out? No one thinks that, right? Except you. So I think that that's, that's why the faith and the confidence and the trust and then having communities of people who are interested in your work and aren't necessarily waiting for it to be published. Um, is so valuable and important because that's the only way you're going to get something finished mm. um, is trusting in yourself. That's, that's true, but I think there's definitely exceptions too. Like I've published so many writers in Overland in the last six years that I've gone, I really hope this person writes a book and then I'm really happy when they write one. And yeah, I no, 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 I'm it. not saying that you shouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, of course, and I think that you do. Like as soon as you have that experience with somebody, you do have something invested in yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. You want them to, you know, finish something more. Um, I like your point, Jen, on courage. And when I'm feeling not brave, which is a lot of the time as a writer, because we're trained, you know, as, as women, as you've said, for many reasons to, to not feel brave anyway. And then when you're looking up at the luminaries and they're all blokes, then that's another um, strike at your self-confidence. One of the things I do, and I genuinely do this, is I pretend I'm a mediocre white heterosexual male. I do, and I think, what would they do? Would they send that email? Would they pitch that story? Yeah, I'm going to do it. And I, I, I am not kidding at all. I, I actually just pretend, what if I was a mediocre white dude? What would I do? Um, the other thing that I say to emerging writers, and being a university lecturer in creative writing, I meet a lot of emerging, aspiring writers. You know, that's kind of my bread and butter. And the, the first thing I encourage them to do is to form a writing group. Mm -hmm. To me, that my writing group, which I've had, I've had two now. I, had, I, came, I came from Perth in 2009, and when I began my PhD, I come from a family where the only books we had on our bookshelf were the Encyclopedia Britannica. English is not my first language, so I grew up in um, a Mauritian and Italian culture, so, and, and both of my parents never went to university, so I came from a non-academic background um, and I decided that I was going to do a PhD because um, I wanted to. And one of the first things I did was grab a group of women that I had been you know, going through honours or undergrad or sessional teaching with and I said, will you be in my writing group? Because I can't do this unless I have support and I'm not going to take everything to my supervisor without having someone else read it first. Um, and that was a, a mistake of inexperience, but it was the best thing I, I ever did because these women, we sat around each other's house. This is, you know, before we had children and, and sick partners. We would once a fortnight go to someone's house um, and read each other's work and comment and give feedback. And that would be, you know, I like this sentence, I don't like this sentence, or it could be, uh, you know, I think you should pitch it here, or have you seen this place is doing this, and they might be interested in your work. And that group went for years, and then I, until I broke it up when I moved to Melbourne, and again, you know, coming to Melbourne, having no friends here, um, started teaching at University of Melbourne and started teaching with a couple of women and I said, will you be in my writing group? You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this unless I have some support. And so um, we did, we formed a writing group and there was a group of, we, we have been going for eight or nine years now, and they're the group in which we published um, the book on female friendship and the book on motherhood. Um, so we work together professionally, but we also, um, are a very valuable network of early readers and encouragement and, and giving us that courage to kind of send your work out or um, put your work forward for a competition or approach this publisher or, you know, should I do this? Yes, you should do it. And for me as well, having, as um, Monica said, a three-month-old baby at home, it's hard. It's an extra distraction. <laughs> I love my kids, but they are, you know, they are things that take my time 
Mm. They take a lot of my time and, and attention and, you know, God love them, that's what you have to do and you're mostly happy to do that but there's always that part of you which would, which would rather be writing or reading, you know, if you're looking at another dirty bum or you're having a conversation with your four-year-old about, no, Mr. Nobody doesn't have a key to our house, no, Mr. No I don't know who Mr. Nobody is. Um, can't shrink himself and get under the mat like you think he can. Um, you know, when you're having these conversations, you know, all these women... He's busy writing his literary bestseller. Yeah, exactly. She probably respects <laughs> that, right? Um, but, you know, having women who are negotiating, we've all had kids um, all at the same time, though um, we're not all heterosexual writers. And, you know, so we have um, all different methods of... Actually, we all have the same method of parenting, which is I'd rather be watching TV right now than <laughs> hanging out with my kids. Um, but having a group of women who understand that particular challenge, to me, has been really important. Having women who understand that particular challenge of finding the time to sit down and write or to sit down and read. and so. One of the things that we talked about is what, how do you do this? How do you juggle this? And so I've come up with this idea. I don't even know if it was me who came up with it. It was two hours every weekend at a cafe, just me, no kids. And it's great because you can say to this group, you know, will that work? You know, in your experience as mothers and writers, does that work? And, you know, you can negotiate these extra levels of, of trickiness that, you know, that come up and, and young kids are tricky. They're lovely and they're great and they're tricky. But I think just more generally writing groups are essential, mm. um, you know, for people and I would never have finished my PhD without my writing group and uh, I love my writing group. We're actually not meeting anymore, sadly, but, um, but most of the people in the writing group were children's writers and then they would still allow me to bring in workshop pieces of my PhD about abortion at the same time as they were reading their children's manuscripts. And so it was very weird, but they were so, it so worked. Mm. You knew those people and it was a really reciprocal relationship and yeah. they'd read your work previously and you'd read their stuff and I don't know, and they were honest and they were good and it was really useful. And I don't know if you have a writing group, Jen. I you? do not have and have never had a writing wow. group. I've never been the kind of person who's comfortable sharing my work with other people until it's ready. And I actually did with this last novel um, and regret it because I think I did it too early in the piece and I should yeah. have just gone there on my own. I don't think it's necessary for everyone to have that community. As I was saying, like I have those kind of relationships with people that aren't in the writing community, but I can talk about industry stuff and I can talk about the other things that are difficult about the career, but um, the work itself, that's between me and the work, and I'm very, very protective of my process, um, so I don't think that is, yeah, it's not for everybody. Mm. One thing that is really important in this context of mentoring as well is about creative process, because I think everybody has a really different creative process and the way to find out what your creative process is, is to create. So you, you work and then the work tells you how the work is going to be done. You know, whether that's fitting it in between kids, whether that's getting up at four in the morning and writing for two hours before you start the day and then going to your day job, whether it's what I did, which is move into my car for a year so that I could finish a novel, like whatever, the work needs from you is what you need to do. And there's no one else who's going to be able to tell you what the right process is for you. It's only the work that can tell you what the process is. So the, the way that you find out is to get started. Um, I think it's important, like mentoring is really important, but you still need to do the work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you find that your process changes with your different novels? Oh, yeah. yeah. Completely. You only, learn, you only learn how to write the book you just wrote, and it's useless for the next one, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's so annoying. Mm. Um, the, I just wanted to quickly touch on um, some of the other experiences of mentoring. So I was going to say that um, we do have a, an internship pr program um, at Overland, so it's for people who uh, are currently studying some kind of um, creative writing uh, degree or, or program, and so it's part of their industry work experience because um, that's that's the way that we think internships can be valuable as well without being exploitative. Um, and so the demands of that internship aren't too onerous. Um, 
for the intern, for the organisation, I find it can be a lot of work, but I actually think that's part of your duty, like, um, as an organisation is to help, um, like, to reach out to other people, and I find it a really good training program, so I think that that is also something that I think has been really valuable for me and for the interns as well. Um, and then there's the working with writers, as we've already discussed, um, and sometimes that can take many months, like, sometimes it's just developing the one piece or the one idea. Um, but just go, to go back to my own PhD, um, that was somewhere where I felt I was mentored exceptionally well. I was really fortunate to have Fiona Cap as one of my mentors and Barbara Book, and um, they were so invested in me and my development and my work. But I was just thinking, listening to us now, that's also because they were paid to, like, mm. I guess. <laughs> you know, your yeah. supervisors are paid You're to. You're writing little dollar signs in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> But it really shifted things for me as a writer. If I hadn't done it, I think that I wouldn't have developed as a writer. And though I'm not working on anything at the moment, I still feel like so, I'm so grateful for those experiences and what I learned like about about writing and craft and kind of myself and and what you can, what why relationships with um, with other kind of established people are valuable as well. Mm -hmm. And there's there's definitely ways to get funding if you find someone that you want to mentor you and you feel that it's appropriate to offer them some money, which it generally is. Um, there's like state and federal arts funding will fund mentorships. There's, I think the Wheeler Center of City of Literature's just launched a yeah, I think I've got program. Something. I don't know how they're recruiting their people, but like um, there's a lot, like writer centers will regularly run mentoring programs. Yeah. And so there's a lot of ways that you can actually make it work without anyone getting exploited either way. Like, they're not always successful. So. Yeah, and sometimes you can just email somebody and ask them if they read something. Yeah. Mm. You know, I think that that's sufficient too. Um, Find them a coffee is always nice. Yes, you know. <laughs> yeah, I say that. Um, <laughs> but it's also, like, I got an email last week that was like, hi, I really love your work. I think it's really similar to my work and you, you could really help me. But it wasn't... It wasn't very nice. <laughs> Maybe just send fan mail if you're going to send fan mail or send a question asking for help. Like, there's gracious ways to ask for help that don't come off as arrogant. Maybe that's something you could workshop with your writing group. <laughs> How to draft that email to a potential mentor without sounding like a total jerk. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you, but just before we go to any questions, if there are questions, um, I think we've covered how we can mentor each other, but do you have any, no, we've kind of covered how you would identify who you'd like to mentor. No, did we? Who you'd like to mentor. Yeah. Is there anything we can talk about that either could allow you to start as a mentor or mentoree that we haven't already covered? I don't know if anybody else feels like that. No, I don't, I don't really know. I think it's the kind of thing that almost has to happen organically mm. in a way for it to work, which is, it's not a very helpful thing to say. Mm. Maybe we could just start with, um, like, I don't know, maybe it's as simple as if you think you're ready for a mentor, um, you could just identify someone and then, like, I guess, like you said, Nat, start reading their stuff for their yeah. work and then think about how you might approach them. Yeah. You get to approach them. Okay. I think having a clear um, having a clear expectation from somebody. Sorry, sorry Monica. I've got a question. <laughs> no, I think having a clear having a clear uh, request for help, like yeah. Yeah. you know, I have one short story that I need feedback on, or I have I would like a six month ongoing relationship where we meet for two hours every week, like to know what is what what you need. Mm. Also, what's realistic? You don't want yeah. it to be too onerous for anybody. Yeah. Go ahead. I've got a question. Um, uh, just two things. Uh, I'd just love to hear you both comment on, or the three of you. Um, first thing, exploitation of the mentor, which you're kind of working around that area, but that sense that when someone contacts you, and what, they want something from you and they want time. And, you know, Natalie, you've got two small kids at the moment. I know when mine were that small, the idea of uh, having a coffee with someone was catastrophic. You know, yeah, and, yeah. and so how yeah, does... Moment. <laughs> well, and if women are doing um, this labour, and it is labour, and yeah. it's often free labour, yeah, how do you negotiate that? And the other thing that I would love to hear a bit more on is if you're not in an institutional setting, if you're completely out of any kind of writing community, but you, you're creative, you're writing, 
it is actually quite hard, isn't it, to just contact someone cold? I mean, the strength of being able to say, oh, I'm doing a course mm. already is a step in the door. So, yeah, what people should do in those situations. Yeah, I think the exploitation of the mentor is not something that a, a mentee doesn't want to get into either because, you know, then that's going to be a relationship that doesn't work. You know, it, um, as a mentor, I, and I haven't really formally mentored anyone really and I'm trying to think what would make me want to mentor someone because if I believed that their work was really important that they were saying things that maybe hadn't been said before in that particular way and that I really wanted them to succeed like I've done it as an editor I remember when we did um, just between us we were so disappointed at how white and middle bred that that book ended up being like it was great it was fantastic book and it was a great experience to, to do it um, but when it came to mothers and others we were like no 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 fuck this we want, we want brown women <laughs> we want indigenous women we want lots of queer women we want um, you know um, non non um, cisgendered people we want a whole range of stories because we we see it as our responsibility to, to do that and that's easier than getting into a mentorship one-on-one -on -one. I think one of the formal mentorships I did was through Australian Society of Authors. And I'm pretty sure, you know, that was a paid gig. So I think if you're not working together, if, if the relationship doesn't involve organically, but you still want to give back, then I think it's appropriate in those instances for a mentor to be paid, you know, because it is their time and their expertise. And we do hear a, a lot about women giving emotional, you know, doing more emotional labour. It's I've kind heard of, of that. <laughs> so unavoidable in this industry, though, mm. for women to not um, to not do that, to, to not expend that emotional labour, right? Between the formal and the informal yeah. like, mentoring as well, because if it is a formal expectation and then you see it as labour, whereas I think that the informal thing is more like it's, it's like an exchange, and it's like you know um, the people have looked out for you in the past, or you you wish they looked out for you more. Mm. You know? I don't know. I think I just see it as part of being a literary citizen, like, and that's. Yeah, I like that. I think that's um, a mentality that you have that I really respect about you, Jacinda, is this idea of citizenship, mm. and being a good it's literary a citizen. I think that's something that I've I've learnt to do better from you as well. Yes, yeah, me too. Thank you. Absolutely. And what was the second part of your question? If you're not in an institutional yeah. setting and you have no access to any of those networks that often quite hard to get into, yeah. particularly when you're a writer. So, yeah, what, what people would do to... I think it's, it's better to approach um, via literary journals, writers' centres, um, writers' groups, go to events if you can, like go to poetry readings and if someone's work resonates with you, approach them and say, I really like your work. Like, don't have it. Don't start with an expectation that someone's going to help you, but start from a ex start from a moment of like, I have a great deal of respect for you. Mm. Like, start a conversation about the work itself, not about your needs or your ego. Um, it's also about curiosity, isn't it? Like, yeah. you're curious about other people's work yeah. and and the events as well. So yeah, again, it's not just about your work; it's about how it fits in that kind of agreement. And ask, yeah, absolutely. And did what ask questions did. about yeah. how people got to where they are. Like, you know, if somebody sent me an email cold saying, can you help me, like, randomly with my work that I know nothing about, then I'm not going to be able to answer that because I don't know what their expectations are. Mm. But if somebody sent me an email saying, so, hey, how did you become fiction editor at Overland? How did that mm. happen for you? Or how does it work being a regional writer? I'll probably quite happily go back and forth like three or four emails and have a conversation with somebody about that. Mm. If there's a particular subject that I feel I am I have experience in, like I, li I like the part of writing where I'm sharing knowledge with other people. And I've found that most writers I know even if they don't, like, even if they don't know me from a bar of soap and I email them cold, most people will respond in a fairly generous and friendly manner to a genuine question. Because mm. it's been so hard for everyone to get to where they are, I think any kind of tricks or tips or anything that you can share is really good. And I think 
you know, it, it plays against this notion that is so patriarchal, but that invades our system, which is that you only get to where you are if you're you're really brilliant or you're really great mm. or you know. Or you're really mean. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's a really unfortunate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and sometimes as a woman writer, you feel like there's only so much oxygen for us, right? So there's that sense. I think the industry wants us to think, not you, but you know, the broader industry wants us mm. to think that we're all competing with each other. And what I've learned over over time is that we're actually not. You know. The story I'm going to tell about being, you know, a someone from a migrant family is very different to, you know, what another person will talk about. Yeah. So. And I find, you know, I'm in the offices in Picador talking to my commissioning editor, and she asks me, "What are you reading?" I'm going to answer that question with six or seven emerging writers that I really yeah. am keen to see, and I'm going to know who I'm opening that door for. You know, I'm very strategic about those conversations because I feel like. I'm in the room, I need to open some fucking windows and let some more oxygen in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that most writers I know are like that. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, a writing industry that keeps promoting the same voices is not a writing industry mm. that's going to be very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a health, t to be a healthy ecosystem, it needs diversity. Yeah, and I think that's, that's really important to do that. I think the internet is another great way. So think of articles like, um, publications like Overland that do publish pieces every day, and reading those works from myself as a as a writer, if I if I like what someone is saying, I might contact them and say, look, I think this is really interesting. Where are you thinking of going with this? Because I'm doing something similar as well. I'd like to sit down and talk to you. So, kind of, I think it always comes back to being a good citizen and engaging in the work first off, mm. and and reading the work and reading it carefully. And then I think you can say, well, how did you get to, to do this. Sometimes you just want to say, how the fuck did you get the time to do this when you've got three <laughs> kids and seven dogs and five cats or whatever? Yeah. Um, and, and people will share their, their strategies with you. So I think, you know, the internet is great because there is so much content and it, it can be so incredibly diverse that you should, yeah, I, I don't think I would feel weird contacting someone via Facebook. Because I would no, just pretend I was yeah. a mediocre white bloke. <laughs> yeah. Send a picture of yourself naked or something. Yeah, <laughs> a, male, yeah. a male picture of Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's um, right. That's right. Yeah. No, I think social media is a big one as well. Like, yeah. if someone contacts me on Twitter as well, I'll yeah. generally reply to them pretty. Yeah, for all the complaints about social media, I think it's been quite democratising in the yeah. yeah. Yeah, especially, I, f I really find that as a regional writer because I don't have, like, generally a literary event a week to go to like people do in Melbourne like yeah. um, I don't have that luxury so that is my water cooler conversation with my colleagues happens over email and via Twitter mostly. Um, now we've got questions. Oh yeah, oh, you, you can sit there or I could just hand you the microphone really. Yeah. Which can get awkward. If you have a question you can come. And no hate speech, respectful. And, um, oh, and no declarations or stories of your life. You can share them, but later. Mm. Mine is a question and not a statement. Um, what can you reasonably expect from a mentor, be it paid or unpaid? Um, what is sort of a reasonable amount of interaction or work to expect them to do for you? I think that's that really sense? individual. Like, mm. I think it depends on what stage of life you're at, what stage of life the mentor is at, what stage of the work you're at and I, I think it's a conversation that you have to have together. The one thing that I think is non-negotiable is that they have to be interested in your work, which is what you discovered that, that dude wasn't <laughs> interested in anyone's work yeah. except for his own, obviously. <laughs> um, they have to be interested in your work. I think he was interested in getting paid yeah. to be a mentor and not having to actually do it. <laughs> we should have got him up today. <laughs> uh, name and shame. Um, but I think that's that's the big thing, is that if you send them your work, that they're going to read it in a reasonable amount of time. And if they don't, then that's probably not the person for you. Yeah. I think it's good to have um, a clear a clear goal and a clear time frame as well. Yeah. If you're applying for funding or if you're approaching somebody, um, have a proposal of, like, how do you feel about, say, Skyping for an hour a fortnight for mm. the three months? 
like this is how long I need to get my manuscript in shape or to get my head around the industry or something like that. So if you've got a specific time frame, it's much easier for someone like me who's got six or seven projects and is trying to run freelance work for money on the side to be able to say, oh yeah, I can do this until October or I can do this, I can manage a couple of hours a week because you know, in six months time I might be deep in another book and not be able to give that much time away. So having a sort of uh, itemised proposal, but then the yeah. flexibility to be able to say, oh, that's not going to work for them, so how about this and this? Um, and I think if you are lucky enough to be in the same kind of city or something as a person, yeah. maybe just asking them for a coffee yeah. um, and an initial conversation is like probably a good place to start. Yeah. Um, because it, I think it is really individual, but it also depends on the work that you're producing or what you want to do, what it is that you want the mentorship for. So I think that initial kind of contact and initial discussion or coffee or something is good. Mm. Yeah, and face to face is great. I mean, it's really hard to get face to face meetings with people who live across, halfway across the country. Yeah, that's yeah. So it's not always I mean, Skype's work, amazing too. But it does yeah. help. Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Yes. Oh, Christy. <laughs> no hate speech. <laughs> I wanted to ask about vulnerability, um, because I think for people to think of themselves as mentors is a bit of, sometimes a bit of a courageous step, particularly women who are conditioned to kind of think, you know, they're not quite there yet. Yeah. But also for people to ask for mentors, I think there's a tendency to feel like, I mean, I think some people have a process for which that's the case, but there's a tendency to feel like they don't want to expose that they don't know. They don't want to expose that they need help. Yeah. That they want to appear together. And that sometimes they're just acknowledging that you need a mentor, acknowledging that you need help, is a very vulnerable um, position to put yourself in. I mean, have you experienced that or do you have sort of... I guess I've never experienced vulnerability of any sort, so I can't answer that question. <laughs> for me, the sheer terror of having to, for me, it was complete a PhD, was the, the first time I put myself in a writing group. Um, and so the sheer terror outweighed any vulnerability, but I totally get that. And I think you tend to feel more vulnerable with people that you don't know well or that um, you tend to put on a pedestal. I've had mentorships that have not worked out, like I've tried really hard in academia to establish mentorships with women academics who are doing similar research to me and sometimes I just don't get back to you and it's it's hard and it's gutting but I've just gone well okay that's not the right person but it is I think one of the things that we have to acknowledge in the industry is that the industry is hard for everyone I don't know anyone who has said oh I wrote this book so oh, easy. easy. <laughs> and like, then this like publisher knocks on my door. It was fantastic. Like, it, you know, the more, and, and that's something I'm really interested in talking about because I think that helps everyone is when you say, this industry is hard. This industry is hard for people. This industry is harder for, you know, the research I'm doing at the moment is with um, women of colour. This industry is harder for women of colour than it is for, for white women. And, um, I think one of the, the ways in which you can kind of make yourself feel a bit better is to, to pay attention to those conversations because I think writing suffers like any artistic industry of that idea of the lone, usually male, genius mm -hmm. banging something fantastic out and then everyone in the world wants to read it, you know. Um, it's a horrible horrible idea that mm. permeates yeah, and I wonder a lot of what we do. Yeah, and I wonder if that is also sometimes what's connected to the vulnerability is this idea of what stage the work needs to be at. Yeah. Or, um, and not long ago we published an Overland this essay, which I think was just great, called We Need More Mediocre Women Artists. <laughs> and I recommend that everyone go and read it because it I'm actually yeah. okay being mediocre. Like, I'm actually okay not being a literary genius or, you know, um, that's, that's like the majority of the world. <laughs> like, that's okay for me. And so I also think that actually, yeah, most literature, like, you know, I think you've got to believe in the work that you're doing and you've got to love it and you've got to think it's important. But it's okay if it's a genre novel about, you know, I don't want to say anything bad because I like genre. I don't know. You know, it's okay if it's not, if it's, I don't know, what's some great literary genius? I can't think of any off the top of my head. But, 
you know, Virginia they exist. Woolf, if you're not Virginia yeah, Woolf you're or not Tony Virginia Morrison or, you know, because only Virginia Woolf and Tony Morrison are Virginia Woolf and Tony Morrison. <laughs> um, yeah, they've already done it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I think, yeah, for me, kind of, and there's no kind of greater, um, you know, marker of inequity than academia and, and looking at the writing that I see my male colleagues pushing forwards on their syllabi and I think, oh, for fuck's sake, why are we, re why are we reading that bloke again? Why are we reading that bloke? And I will, I will now go up and have those conversations. Why are we reading that bloke? You know, why have you got in there? This is so ridiculous, you know. Um, I'm not very popular amongst my male colleagues, <laughs> but I don't particularly care anymore because I, I don't think that's really, you know, being nice to them, you know, that idea of being nice and mm. is not as important yeah. as having students, because at VU I have students from every kind of culture, the, you know, we are the University of Hard, hard Knocks and having students come in and if I'm just giving them, I don't know, T.S. Eliot and Samuel Beckett, then who does that help? I mean, it doesn't. So I think paying attention to the ways and acknowledging that the industry is hard for everyone is one of those ways that you can kind of overcome that vulnerability perhaps. And also thinking about how you'd like to see it change, like yeah. how it can be better, you know, I think that's important too. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that, um, one of the people that I asked for advice about this was my friend Marianne Butler, who's um, a playwright who won the Victorian Premier's Prize a couple of years ago, fabulous, brilliant playwright and one of the most generous writers that I know. Um, and of course, you know, sent me two pages of notes when I asked her for help with this, as is her habit. Um, but one thing that she identified, she's done a lot of mentoring and being mentored through her theatre practice, which is a lot more collaborative than um, novels. Mm. But um, one thing that she really identified was ego on both sides is really dangerous. And one, I think part of that vulnerability is an inability to detach self-worth from the worth of the work that you've made, yeah. um, particularly when you're starting out and you put everything into your first book or your first project. And it's quite difficult to see that as a thing that isn't, that isn't you, or that a judgment on the flaws of this work aren't judgment on your personal flaws. And she said the same thing goes for the mentor. If their ego is too involved, then it won't work. And she said something hilarious was, it's a bit like teachers and cops. If they like power, they're going to be shit at mentoring. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had to share that one with you. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, a lot of that is to do with time for me. Like if you can put the work aside for a while and then come back to it with fresh eyes, sometimes that's enough to just give you that detachment from it. Um, but yeah. Questions? I can bring the microphone to you. It's easier. Nothing? You've got another thing to say, do you? No one has any questions. Yes, you do. But someone's too scared to ask. <laughs> and now I've made you even more scared. <laughs> oh, yes. Carly, I've always wanted to meet you, Carly. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, uh, you can come up. Do you want to come up? <laughs> Live tweeting your own question. <laughs> Um, how do you manage the expectations as a mentor when people come to you? You're really busy and there's been occasions where I've been yelled at by people, mostly online, for being unable to help because I can't, you know, it's yeah. either time or yeah. emotional labour or they're asking me to recommend them a doctor or something or, or diagnose them. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, I've not really had that problem. Maybe I just have a really like aloof and standoffish personality that <laughs> find me really unapproachable and that's my defence system. I call it sea anemone. Um, <laughs> I think you just, that's shit that that's happened to you. Yeah. It's, that's the last thing you want to do to your mentor is yell at them. Um, yeah. <sighs> that's bad menteeing. Um, I think just being really honest and saying, look, at the moment, I could only do, you know, I could read a thousand words per month and that's all I can do. And if you need something more than that, then you should look for someone else. Mm. And maybe you could recommend someone if you know, but don't do the research for them is what I would say. Um, I also think you should just feel okay to say no. Mm. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know. But Yes, gorgeous. Um, 
But I know that a number of us are on um, the women full of bind it, the binders, and there's, I think there's other community groups on Facebook and stuff as well, of, mm. of writers. And um, I think that those places can also be useful because often, you know, if you are looking for somebody, you can go there and put it there instead of just relying on one person who you've identified as being your mentor and maybe they haven't got the time. Mm. Um, but I think that that's a really useful space as well. I know not everyone's on Facebook, yeah. but it can yeah. be really useful for, you know, for people and making connections um, or just getting ideas for how to approach things differently as well, which can be useful. Yeah. Anything else? Oh. Yeah, I was wondering about self-publishing, like if someone writes something that hasn't been done before, I'm specifically thinking of my sister that is studying something that is very new and she, does, she wants to look up at mentors but it hasn't been done and she sent her work but has had no reply. And I was wondering if it's possible to like decide to just self-publish yourself and difficult that might be. Absolutely. And yeah. self-publishing is actually one of the areas where it's really easy to find help and advice um, online because a lot of people who have done it are really ready to share their experiences through their blogs and websites and other forums about what's worked for them. In fact, South Australian Writers' Centre is running a whole self-publishing seminar in a couple of weeks, I think. Um, which doesn't help you if you're in Victoria, but like there's a lot of um, information about what works for people and what doesn't. So um, I think it's probably easier to approach a, another self-published writer for help and mentoring than it is to approach someone who's published by Penguin or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I think there's lots of avenues to self-publish these days. I guess it depends what kind of audience they're trying to reach, your sister. Um, and is it an academic work or? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. No, not really. Right. It's, uh, in positive psychology. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that seems to me like something that could easily gain an audience um, yeah. like self-publication, but I don't know a lot about self-publishing, so I think Jen's idea is really good about yeah. just, um, because there is so much information about it, particularly online, so I'd suggest that for them. Yeah, and some really amazing writers have self-published, like Virginia Woolf is self-published, mm. you know? Mm. Yeah. Doesn't get better than that. <laughs> yeah, in my opinion, yeah, I love her work. I think she's amazing, but, you know, I think we, yeah, can feel a bit vulnerable about self-publishing. I don't think we need to. Yeah. Well, now we've got a line of people. That's exciting. Hi. Um, my name is Chidem. Uh, I have two questions, actually. One is I learned English when I was mid twenty, so English is my second language. My background is actually writing for screen. That's my background. Also, I write short stories as well. But I know I do make a lot of mistakes, grammar mistakes. Sometimes I do get help from friends. They can help me if it's short. Uh, it's not always possible to get help always. And I don't have really budget to pay someone mm. always to do proofreading at this stage. So um, how is that important? Like that really affects my confidence. Like, yeah. uh, should I send this my work to someone else? Stuff like that. So, what you can tell about that? Firstly, congratulations for learning another language in your twenties. That is friggin' hard, and that you can speak and write in it is incredible to me. Like, just amazing. Um, I don't, I don't know if I, one of the things I learned when I was doing, I think it was just between us, is how rough some of the work came to us from some of the authors. And I, you know, as an emerging writer was like, every comma has to be in place or no one is going to take me seriously. You know, that, that kind of pressure you put on yourself. So I think talk to, 
anyone that you're pitching your work to, just be open and honest yes. with them, you know, mm -hmm. and just say, this is the situation. Um, this is my second language, which I learned in my 20s, and I'll wait for your applause and then I'll get back to you, um, <laughs> to my question. But I think being open and honest, no, I think it's so hard. And I think being open and honest about that is really important because a lot of editors are not looking and, and certainly we weren't with those books. We were looking for the, the stories rather than the polished pieces. So uh, I think good editors are really willing, and I know Jacinda is a good editor, really willing to work with the author to get the piece to where it needs to be. Yeah. If they think the piece is important and has things, you know, things to say. So. And I always read the cover letters mm -hmm. um, that come with our submissions. So all our submissions are online, but I always read them and they always offer extra context. Well, if somebody writes them they always offer extra context, so I think that that's fine. But I do wonder um, if you've thought about a writing group, if that's something that you would be open to, if you know any other writers or even just a couple of friends who may be interested. Uh, yes, uh, I have in the past, but we then, we kind of... Stopped. <laughs> no, they continued, but it just somehow um, they didn't want me to be included oh, in the group. <laughs> I don't know, the reason it just... Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that's awful, but it does happen. It's yeah. happened to me previously in the past. Um, but uh, I would just say find some new people who you mm. connect with, um, because I think that when it comes to when it comes to this, I don't know. I just think it might be useful for you. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I also, I just wanted to add that perfection is really overrated. Mm. The English language is imperfect everywhere you look. It's a hybrid beast. It's like constructed of all of these other historic mm. languages within it. And there's a lot of beauty in imperfect, so-called imperfect English. And I think a good editor will bring that voice out, that personal style that you find being able to, you know, repair mistakes, but also being able to celebrate the diversity within English. That's something that should value in your own work. And some journals I know in Australia take work written in other languages. So I think Peril mm. is one that takes work in other languages. The Lifted Brow has a translation editor as well. Yeah, um, Offset at VU takes work in other languages. So I think, you know, look for those journals as well that uh, encourage multilingual submissions, yeah. Yes, yeah, second question is, um, I have already written pieces. They're just sitting on my computer, and I'm so hesitant to send them uh, somewhere to publish. So, um, any suggestion to overcome this um, fear? So, I have a, mm -hmm. a bit fear. So, this is where I have the disappointing news. You just have to be courageous. Because um, as an editor, like we reject 90% of the work that comes in because you know we only have four issues of a print magazine and this daily online magazine, but still we have so many pieces that are submitted to us. Um, and so rejection is part of the writing life. And I think that um, I think that you've got to not take it personally. Yeah. I know it's so hard okay. to say that. And um, I still get disappointed when I've been rejected for things, but um, it's just that is just. It's not always going to be right, the piece for the place that you send it to. But I think that like sending more pieces out is more likely to result in publications as well. Yeah, what's the worst thing that can happen is if somebody says no. Yeah. <laughs> but also think about where you're pitching your work. Yeah. Make yeah. sure that you're pitching to a magazine that has a similar politics or ideology. You become familiar with the journal, you know, read their work. Um, and similar and pretend... interests and preoccupations too. Yeah. And just do that trick of pretending you're a mediocre white man. Is that what would also, he do? What would he, he would do? not wait until everything's perfect before no. he started submitting. Is yeah. that also, though, your role as editor in that, that when you have an editor who rejects you but does it in a way that's so supportive, can make all the difference? Absolutely. Mm. And you don't want to work with someone who's going to reject you and be an asshole about it, basically. You know, why would you spend your time work, you know, sending work to that magazine? Would it be okay to ask someone, you know, if they reject your work, can you ask them reason or can you ask them for feedback? You can and sometimes, yeah. it, sometimes it will work and sometimes they just won't have the time to get back to you. Yeah. So it really just depends. If I have something useful to say and I think that it might benefit the writer, I will try to pass it on. But sometimes the piece just isn't right and you 
don't know how to say that. So sometimes you would just give a general mm. kind of rejection. So, um, but it's not, there's no harm in asking, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would ask. Yeah. Like so. Thank you, and thanks for the great panel. Uh, um, uh, my name's Deb, Deb Wardle, and I, to me, one of the um, wonderful things about writing is in the quality of relationships that can develop in these, particularly when we get people in, in our corner supporting mm. our work and championing our work. Um, um, and I've had some experience of mentoring and being a mentee. I always think of the minty. I, I think of a manatee. Yeah, I say manatee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think a minotaur and a manatee. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I was just wondering if any of you would like to make the comment about the transition in relationship between at first um, of some inequality, perhaps when you're asking for help at oh. first, towards that aspiration of mutuality, which um, is such an important part of the quality of relationship that... Mm when it really works. And I just mm. thought that may be a useful part of the conversation to bring up is how the relationship will change over time towards mutuality. Yeah. There's a couple of people that I'm thinking of, the other writers that have been really um, helpful to me in my writing life. Um, and Kate Kennedy and Patty O'Reilly, both really excellent <laughs> Victorian short story writers. Um, both of whom... I really looked up to uh, when I first met them and both of whom I now consider to be peers um, and both of whom have consistently treated me as an equal throughout that relationship. So there's no point at which, at which I've been an underling even when they've been teaching me a shit ton of things um, and I think that's why those relationships are important to me. Like, um, you know, I just recently commissioned a story from Patty and it's really nice to be on that, to be able to, like, say, be able to do something for her or, mm. you know, ask her for help. But I don't know. I think that egalitarian thing is something that you need to have coming in, even if you're in really different positions in the industry. Yeah, I completely agree, and I think it's part of getting that relationship right. I think it's going to be individual to every mentor-mentee relationship. Um, as to how that evol evolves and, you know, I've, I, as a mentee, have known pretty quickly when a mentor is not right for me. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they were to treat me like I didn't know what I was talking about, if they were to talk down to me or if they were to patronise me in any which way or form, I would be out of there because I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm going for help but I don't need to feel like I'm two foot small yeah. in going for help and I think a good mentor wouldn't do that. Um, so I think also it's an organic thing. The relationship evolves over time. In, in my really important mentorships, I have found that it just evolves over time. You stop being so frightened of your mentor and start asking them more questions about their work and they start sharing a bit more. It, it, it changes. So um, I don't know the particular steps you would take to make it change. I just know that, you know... Um, and being open and interested in your mentor's work is really important too, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, and I mean, I understand what you're saying about the power imbalance or the seeming power imbalance, but I feel like, um, I don't know, you're not asking them to be a better person or something, you're just asking them for guidance on some, and navigating something that mm. they're experiencing or something somehow. I don't know. I hadn't really thought about that before, I guess. I think that... Sure. The, egalitarian mutual respect thing, um, something that I've been thinking about a lot this year is the way that this, the, the literary industry, this sort of business that we run around and try and accomplish things in, is actually just a one layer of something that goes much deeper, the roots of which are really reciprocal culture and that there's a much older kind of system underpinning everything that we do and that the model for um, those support networks is not actually about mentoring as much as it is about um, friendship and peer support and cooperation. Um, yeah. One last question. No. 
You have 10 seconds. <laughs> I think that's, that's probably it then. Can I say something uh, before we finish, Monica? Yeah, you can. Okay, thanks. Um, Jacinda and I, when we met um, last week, we were talking about how we wanted the session to end. And one of the things I think happens in a session like this is everyone's like, yeah, I'm so pumped. I'm, I'm going to get a mentor. Or I'm, I'm going to do this. And then you people get terrified and then they don't. So um, we really wanted to encourage people in the room to, to you know, just to go out and to read and to, to, to think about what you need and what you want and who who you think can, and ha can help. And hopefully, the way we've talked about things, you won't feel so intimidated mm. to, to go out and to seek help. Because if someone is busy, they'll just say, I'm busy and yeah. I can't do it. You know, yeah. And they might say, I have a colleague who's on leave, or I have a colleague who's doing this. Um, and also to think about if you're ready to mentor someone and you know, um, offering your help as well. Because I think that's really important. If you have the time, if you have the inclination, I think, you know, doing both of those things. And I think all that is really important, but also um, I really like what you said about thinking about your work and where you're at and what you want to do with it, because I think that too often we don't think about those things and um, that it's okay to think about what you want to do and where you want your work to go and the steps that might lead to that. Mm. Which obviously is the writing, like Jen stressed, yeah, so really definitely. the writing of the thing, but also there are other steps involved to getting it out to an audience as well. Yeah, and apply for everything that you see, every opportunity. It's send work before you think it's ready. Like, just mm. put things out there. Don't second guess yourself. Mm. Really important. Oh, thank you. What incredibly generous uh, women. Let us all be like that <laughs> at all times in our life. Um, before we thank our wonderful speakers, though, can I remind you that this afternoon's session that's on, Resist Words for the Feminist Activist, which looks phenomenal, um, there are, I think there's still tickets available, Christy, yeah. You should see Giselle at the front door, but she's not here because she's sick. So don't see her at the front door. But you can see whoever is at the front door prior to the session. Um, that's on at three. Uh, huge thank you to the three of you. Um, thank you so much for your, your words and your inspiration. Could we all... I also want to thank the Victorian government <laughs> just for being here, <laughs> for getting things moving. Um, no, they've been really good actually about the festival. They have been really good if they're here um, and always. Um, and thank you to our venue partner, the Queen Vic Women's Centre. They've been really generous and fabulous um, to work with. There's book sales and signings. They're going to be happening downstairs in the foyer. Uh, so go down there and you can chat. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming to, uh, to the festival. It's, the festival is all about you. And it's been a wonderful day and a half. And if you go to Resist, it'll be a wonderful two days. So thank you. Thanks, guys.